creativity of our community. I'm Sarah Lester, the proud director of the Maywood Memorial Library. <laughs> Next year, we look forward to hosting our 10th annual Maywood Ideas Festival in our new library on Baker Street. So wow. we with Matthew Gal Galkin, uh, with Roselle Benali and David Melman, the directors and editor of Murder and Big Horn, and acclaimed film editor Tim Squires. The Ideas Festival is sponsored by the Essex County Division of Cultural Affairs, a partner of the New Jersey State Council for the Arts, the Maplewood Library Foundation, the Friends of the Maplewood Library, Words Bookstore, and the Maplewood Women's Club. A big thank you to the creative and talented staff at the Maplewood Library for putting this festival together. And I just ask all the staff to stand. is the founder of Fairhaven Films, which produced the docuseries Murder in the Bayou, Murder in Bighorn, and Empires of New York. Galkin has directed three documentary films and is currently in production on a film for HBO. On March 12, 2020, Matthew was scheduled to moderate a discussion with Barry Sonnenfeld as part of the 2020 Maplewood Ideas Festival. That event was the first casualty of the pandemic, so we're thrilled to have him here tonight, three years later. Matthew lives in South Carolina. Ogala Lokoda Dine, film director and screenwriter, Rizal Benali, holds a BFA from the Institute of American Indian Arts and is currently in her thesis year of MFA candidacy of film production at Tisch School of the Arts. Murder in Bighorn is her most recent project. Her directorial narrative feature debut, Winter in Black Mesa, is in the works. is a documentary film and television editor. The films he's worked on have won two Oscars, a South by Southwest Jury Prize, a Cinema Eye Award, and numerous audience awards. He loves any opportunity to tell an engaging and impactful story, learn new things, and collaborate with great people to get there, which turns out to be a pretty good way to sum up the process of editing Murder in Big Bar. has edited 26 feature films, including 13 for director Ang Lee. Four have received Oscar nominations for Best Picture, Life of Pi, Gosford Park, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and Sense and Sensibility. Other films include Unbroken, Rachel Getting Married, Syriana, The Ice Storm, and The Wedding Banquet. His work has received two Oscar nominations for editing. He has also edited a wide variety of television and music video projects, and his documentary work includes collaborations with Bill Moyers, Michael Moore, Alex Gibney, and George Butler. We were honored to have Tim present at the 2014 Maplewood Ideas Festival, and we're so glad to have him back this year. <coughs> He's lived in Maplewood for 35 years. Thank you, Sarah. So, uh, to start, first just tell us about the film. Yes, that's me. Hello? Hello? Awesome. Well, first of all, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Um, uh, I love doing things like this um, that are super community oriented, and I'm very grateful for being uh, able for doing this out here. So, thank you. Thank you for your attending tonight. Uh, Murder in Big Horn is a doc series um, brought to you by Matthew and I and an amazing team. Uh, it's, it focuses on cold cases uh, of several young indigenous girls who have either gone missing or who have been murdered in the state of Montana, specifically on the Northern Cheyenne and on the Crow Agency. And uh, we kind of delve deep into that. And, we wanted to, I guess, approach the subject matter from the perspective of the, the families themselves who haven't really had the platform before to, to speak their truth. Um, and we really just wanted to kind of share
share that human aspect of what's going on in that, in that area. And the historical context as well. Yeah, definitely the historical context. So it's a three-part docu series on Showtime. Yep. And how did it come about? How did each of you get involved? So I've had a sort of years-long relationship with Showtime. Um, I did a series for them a few years ago called Burger of the Bayou. And so they came to me with a very sort of vague idea. I think they had read an article in the New York Times uh, that came out in early 2020 about a case in rural Montana, an indigenous girl going missing. They just sort of sent it to me and they said, it, you know, it, would this be of interest to you to make it a documentary series? And so over the course of a couple of months, we had these sort of back and forth conversations, me trying to convince them that I wasn't actually the right guy to make this series um, because I'm a white Jewish male. Like, this is the wrong, I'm the wrong guy for you. And, you know, over, you know, two or three months, we finally sort of figured out that we, I mean, there's probably something that I could contribute to this, um, to this series if I had the right team around me. So I set about trying to find, um, you know, the right indigenous team of filmmakers. And so the first call that I made was to a man named Bird Running Water, who was the head of the Sundance Indigenous Filmmakers Program, who sort of had a great beat on all of the indigenous filmmakers in this country um, that I might want to talk to. So um, he connected me with a guy named Sterling Harjo, who, uh, who since has created the show Reservation Dogs. Um, both of them said the same thing, which is Rizal Ben Ali is the person that you need to be talking to. And so I reached out to Rizal, and you know, I would say Rizal interviewed me as much as I interviewed Rizal, as far as like, would this be a good collaboration? And that was early, that was what, late 2020? Um, and it turned out to be great. Yeah. And what, I mean, how did you approach the process of this guy coming in to say, I want to do this, uh, this documentary about your stuff. Yeah, you know, so um, where I come from, my mother's from the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, and my dad's from the Navajo Reservation. And so um, I have some friends who run programs out there, and they did kind of like a general study about this the statistics of non-natives coming into our community, specifically Pine Ridge, where there was an average of six film projects being made there, but they were all being produced and created by non-native people. So we're having, so the, the, the thing is we're having an influx of non-native folks coming into our communities and extracting um, stories. And so uh, when Sterling called me and said, hey, you know, he was very blunt, I'm not going to lie. He was basically like, hey, this is my guy that uh, wants to make an MMIW doc. Are you interested? He was talk to you. <laughs> I was like, oh, geez, that doesn't sound very enticing. You another, know? <laughs> another one. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, the, there's a lot of, like I said, there's a lot of projects coming into Pine Ridge. Just but, and then, and then uh, IW is missing and murdered indigenous women. Yeah, sorry. Uh, missing murdered indigenous women. Um, we utilize the acronym MMIW to, to shorthand that because it's such a prevalent issue. And so uh, when Sterling first brought that up, um, I was hesitant. And I'm very protective. I'm very protective of our stories and community. Even though I'm out here on the East Coast uh, further studying film at NYU, um, I very much grew around grew up around my community and people, so I always felt a sense of responsibility to ensure that our stories were being told authentically and appropriately. And um, so I did. I, I took up the, the, the phone call with Matthew, but Matthew wasn't like anybody I've ever talked to before. And that's a good thing, because um, it turns out that we saw really eye to eye about what we wanted to portray in the series and what was important. And I felt like he really understood and, and, and respected our people and our communities. And, and I felt like he truly needed a, a partner in this, in this project to, to, to do right by these stories. And, and here we are, you know, years later, along with David. Um, and, and I and I, and I feel good about it. Good about you know what what everybody did with the series, what we did, 
ensuring that these families' truth and honesty were brought forth by the, by the documentary. Serious. And David, you and Matthew have worked together before, right? Yeah, Matthew and I have Matthew and I've been working together for nearly 10 years, off and off, on, on projects. Um, and yeah, so we've, we've worked together and have had that kind of collaboration in the past, and I think it was, you know, I was uh, always trying to make myself better. And, uh, yeah, and, uh, yeah I, I know what that's like. So yeah, that's, that's how I, I got involved. And, uh, and there's another editor of family on the series as well. Uh, who's another editor who I work with, you know, you know as, an, as a co-editor of the series, I'm probably for me. Also, for me, for me, for me. And in the, in the credits, I think for two episodes, you know, this is director, and one year, this is director, but your executive producer is on the other. Does that represent reality, or is, I mean, was there a different role, or what, was the, what were the roles that you took? Um, well, is there, is there Directors Guild of America representative in the audience? Because <laughs> <laughs> if there is not, then... Show yourself. Yeah. There is. Uh, so the, the goal is always for Rosal and I to share directing credit on everything, um, but the, the DGA doesn't allow teams of directors unless you... It's complicated. Unless you're like a... Or you're the Cone yeah, brother. Uh, unless you can demonstrate a sort of a, a legacy, a history with this other person. So we just decided that we would just alternate directing credits, um, and we were both producers on each other's episodes. Um, but in the you know when we were out shooting, we were together every second, pretty much. So we, we actually held hands and skipped down the road. <laughs> <laughs> as, as all good collaborations. I'm sure that, I'm sure that they made the subjects feel feel much warmer about talking to. Uh, that, that actually. <laughs> So in the in the series there are you know, it's about this issue but it's told specifically through three cases three specific instances of young women who disappeared. Um, was that planned going in or was that something you discovered in the shooting process or even in post? I'll, I'll start it off. So Matthew and I going into this already had an idea of the, the, the cases that could potentially, I should say that we could potentially cover during the series. And that was sort of based on families who had already been vocal prior about, you know, whether it was um, negligence, whether it was lack of something from law enforcement, but also because of the amount of press that had already kind of came to them. Uh, we focus on, first of all, Bighorn County because of the high, higher concentration, concentration of cases in the state and overall in the general demographic of the United States. But really, we didn't want to like badger people at the very core of it to see if they wanted to do the series with us because for me as a native person, you know, to think that if my family was grieving about loved ones, like I couldn't imagine media trying to come in and bad news. Hey, do you want to tell your story again and again? You know, we don't, um, in the beginning we didn't know where these families were, but if they had been vocal prior um, with newspapers and media, then we figured that might be a good place to start. So that was more of the logistical approach. And then from there, uh, we kind of started to dig deeper. And I can let you take over that. It's a good, good baton pass. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, if I'm being honest, Showtime approached me uh, with the idea of doing a true crime series on a native reservation. That was sort of like, that was, I think, what they wanted the series to be. It's a very sort of blunt, uh, because obviously that's a very um, popular genre that seems to make people watch. But, you know, Rizal and I knew from the beginning that that was only um, our way in the door. It was, the, the whole idea of the series is to basically use that genre as a bait and switch. So you, you sort of lure people in with this idea that you know, I mean, there is a, a sort of a central mystery to this series, but really, ultimately, it's much more about the historical context 
um, and why Native women are so vulnerable um, on reservations currently um, and have been for for 150 years. Um, and and we sort of already knew that we were going to take that direction because these cases didn't actually have an ending. Um, and that's the reality of the mass epidemic that we're dealing with on uh, my communities back home, uh, whether it's the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, whether it's the Crow Agency, Northern Cheyenne, the Diné Reservation, the Four Corners, so on and so forth. Um, a lot of families just do not know what happened to their loved ones, and the sad, messed up reality is that they may never know because of the way the cases were handled, whether it was negligent, whether there was enough manpower or resources, or whether there was discrimination involved, you know? Um, and so we knew going in that we weren't going to be able to like solve these cases. We're not trained private investigators, we're not trained police force, we're not, you know, there's only so much we can do as like investigative documentary. But we're not even investigative. It's, not, not, even investigative. Our, it's not even our job to yeah. like, solve crimes. You know, we're we're not, we have to film school. Exactly. Don't teach you how to film school. <laughs> we're, we're kind of like, we're not the athletes, we're kind of like the water boys. <laughs> I think like there's an unrealistic expectation. Yeah. There's, there's an unrealistic expectation in sort of true crime documentary of like this idea that filmmakers are going to solve crimes. It's like that's ridiculous. No, the only, the only way that's going to happen is something was already solved. And that's the, that's the messed up reality. That's the truth that we wanted to present. It was just how to get everybody on board figuring out how to present that. And that's kind of where David comes in. You know. Yeah, I mean, I feel like um, there were so many pieces um, and so many Stories that started and then stories that stopped. Uh, stories that we then had to, uh, you know, figure out because I think, like you guys are saying, they wanted a true crime film. They didn't want an advocacy film. We wanted to make an advocacy film that was masquerading as a true crime film. There was no true crime. There were the, the pieces of the true crime were not either there or weren't strong enough to sort of, you know, make a new man. There was no. There was no solution, there was no body to be found. Um, and so, uh, but, but what needed to happen, which I think was really interesting, was that we were very much trying to create this true crime piece. Um, and it just, was, it just was never, it wasn't working. We were trying to make good partners for Showtime, but it just didn't. It just wasn't working. And then we were like on this call, and, and it was always like, guys, we've got to tell the story. And we were like, uh, but nobody wants PBS. And it's sort of like, <laughs> okay, well, how do you do it? You know, you can't have that. So you, go, you can't have the PBS style of historical patterns. How do you do it? And so I think um, that became the challenge is sort of both how to kind of tell these incomplete stories um, in a way that was both somatic and engaging, um, while also somehow weaving in what would otherwise be considered kind of Educational, historical documentary. Historical, in a way that sort of moved into that. And so that became sort of a big challenge, both structurally and, you know, in terms of the elements. Yeah, the, the times when it does veer into starting to feel like a true crime, you know, really going through the details of the cases, it's very engaging. And, and also, at times, use that to lead into interviews, which have been very emotionally engaging, too. So, it works really well for you, but you know, but you don't go all the way you know, follow through on it because I guess you couldn't, but also you have a bigger story to tell. Yeah, and I think that's actually a nice segue to talk about the collaboration process between all of us. I think at the heart of it, it really comes down to perspective and lived experience. You know, um, Matthew and I going into this, uh, we're very different people. Um, I think in a lot of aspects, and our common link was we both went to NYU, and we both went to New Jersey at the moment, which is awesome. 
<laughs> Jersey City. Um, so, for me, growing up as a young girl, a native girl, um, I was born in Oregon. We moved around a lot when I was a kid. Ended up in South Dakota. My mom and I were living in the border town of Rapid City, South Dakota, which is adjacent to the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. Uh, for those of you that don't know, a border town is just a, a town that's next to a, like a, an Indian reservation, basically. And um, border towns tend to be very discriminatory against uh, natives. Um, and sort of grown up there, graduated high school from there, was very kind of, I was accustomed to like a lot of the discrimination against, against my people as a whole. And having lived life, moving all around afterwards, going to college, now in grad school, ending up out east, I felt very acclimated to just a lot of different communities, a lot of different towns and whatnot. And but I'm very super connect, I'm super connected to my own communities and uh, my traditions and my cultures, um, the language and, and the land in South Dakota and on the Navajo Reservation. And so when him and I came together, um, it almost felt like the perfect checks and balances relationship where when we were interviewing people in these communities, I saw them as my own relatives. I saw them as my aunties, as my uncles, my grandfathers, grandmothers, as my cousins. And it was really easy, it was really easy for me to personally connect. But at the same time, we're making a doc series. And I knew that I couldn't let myself um, lose control over my own biases, even though I was looking at people that looked like me, that were like me. And um, that's sort of, I feel like, where Matthew would come in. He always had the big picture in mind. And the way we worked together was amazing because I felt, I feel like we we're able to produce a more well-rounded project. And the fact that we have editors that are not of the communities that were, again, able to see the bigger picture, which is super important because we're thinking about network, we're thinking about general audiences, we're thinking about all these things. And if I was completely in charge of that, I don't know if it would have made sense to a lot of people because I'd be so focused and worried about uh, ensuring and staying true completely to, to just this one perspective. And that may not have been completely beneficial to the broad, bigger idea and project of what we're trying to do. And I mean, it was always our goal from the beginning to reach the widest possible audience. So, to Rizal's point, I feel like the combination um, of our native crew members and our non-native crew members sort of added up to a whole that was bigger than the sum of its parts. So, just to talk head in for a minute. The uh, at what point did you start getting footage, and at what point did you start working on the project, you know, with documentaries, I mean, some of it is interviews and stuff that they shot, some of it is archival, you know, how did that whole process uh, work? Um, I wish I could tell you. Uh, <laughs> I, I know what it's wrong, I actually know what it's wrong for you, which was, like, early 2020, when I was in those conversations with Sharetime about whether we should even do this or not, whether I was the right guy. And David and I would meet for coffee once a week, and I would, we would just sit on a bench in Maplewood downtown, and I would just pull my hair out and be like, I'm not the right guy for this, what should I do? It was like my therapist, basically. There's no ending. There's no ending. <laughs> to what end are we doing this? Uh, okay. And actually, I also remember when you said you spoke with Sterling Arjo and uh, the folks you were saying, like, they, I, I told them that, they said, they, before they told you to call Renault, out, was that what they said? Yeah. You shouldn't even try it's to do Yeah, it's, too, it's too, too much of a political minefield for you personally to watch. And they were both great. And they were very blunt and, and brutally honest. Um, but they basically said, if you're going to do this, results should be your point. Yeah. But, but I started, I would say, relatively early, early in the process and, and earlier than any of us thought because the edit went on longer. Uh, 
than we expected. How long was it? The edit was a year, most of the day, for three, for three hours. Um, and for me, uh, Fanny came on, I don't know, maybe two months after me when she left. Maybe a month before, I think. Um, and, um, you know, we had, you know, with this kind of project, we, uh, we always started kind of with the interviews and really just trying to, like, nail down some sort of thread. We sort of, like, the interviews were inside and sort of tell the, the three main stories of these three girls in some sort of, some sort of coherent way. Um, and dividing it up into sort of, to these true crime categories of, like, level one, level two, and level three. Like, what you could reveal early, what would be a development, and what would be the, like, the shocking detail that would sort of fall in it, or, or what would fill in the end sort of make you So we spent a lot of time kind of, like, figuring that out. Uh, we had another producer, uh, Josh Levine, uh, and then there was Calico, who were both sort of, you know, kind of, like, kind of sort of, mind trust of all the material. Um, and it was just sort of like, so we really were sort of focusing on story, story, story. There's not a whole lot of other thing in the film that's sort of not more than just sort of something, you know, for a moment. It's not like this forwards of story. So it was really very much in the Yeah, and about the interviews, I mean, you know, if you're doing a documentary, a, a historical thing, and you're talking to a historian describing the weapons they used in the medieval battle or something, that's that's one kind of interview. But these interviews, you're interviewing people who maybe are not accustomed to being interviewed, who maybe don't trust you, don't know whether to trust you, don't know what your motives are, and you're interviewing about them some about something that's deeply personal and emotional. How did you go into these interviews? How did you prepare for them and approach them? Well, I think a big part of that actually has to do with me and our producers, Ivan and Ivy. And um, and it's true. I mean, we've had like a lot of experience. I mean, I've had, I've seen personally, I've witnessed, I should say, I've witnessed non-native folks go into our communities and be completely disrespectful and just take and leave people just with nothing. And um, it made a lot of folks in our communities, um, in the Plains area, really hesitant to talk to media folks, documentarians, directors, producers, because they didn't want to give their all, they didn't want to reopen wounds and dig into their trauma so other people could take their stories, run, and, you know, make inappropriate decisions about their lives and what had occurred to them. <coughs> Very personal things. And so whenever it came time to us, when we first approached the families, we did it in a culturally traditional way. We approached families, you know, with with gifts and and we I, along with Ivan uh, and Ivy, I think it was mostly Ivy. Me and Ivy were like the on, on the ground folks. And Ivan and Ivy are brother and sister who are native, they're Blackfeet filmmakers. Yeah, they're, they're sibling, sibling, dynamic duo, I like to call them. <laughs> and um, it was Ivy and I, and, and, and we, would, we would go and introduce ourselves to these families in person after emailing them and, and we'd say, hey, like, this is who we are, real life people, first of all. This is Matthew, look at him. <laughs> and, uh, but we would talk with them about how um, we all get to make decisions and we all get, you know, us as the native folk and how we actually have relatives who are missing, all of us, unfortunately, on the team. And, uh, and we also have um, family members who have also been murdered, and we don't know what happened to them. And so, because Ivy and Ivy and I are all in the same boat, and this is a real life thing that we've all dealt with in all of our families, we would look at them and basically say, hey, like, we know what it's like. This is what happened in our families. We are, 
not maybe not in the same boat as you are, but we all have similar stories and similar situations in our families, and we are trying to do something about it. And this is our intention. And you can participate in our project if you would like to get your story out there. We bring you these gifts to ask this. You can take the gifts and receive it, if, even if you don't participate. But this is what we're trying to do, and this is why. So we were very transparent. We did it in a culturally, like I said, traditional and appropriate way. And we let them think about it. And then eventually, they either said yes or no. Nobody really said no. Um, and from there, we were just stayed in open communication with the families because we weren't trying to make the story that was gonna be this jaw-dropping next big thing. It's, like I said, we really have to straddle the line of doing right by families, advocacy, trying to make it make sense to everybody, and, you know. I think you guys also had the benefit relatively early on of being one of the characters who's Luella, who became sort of Luella was a um, is was sort of the editor in chief of the local newspaper and was connected to everybody. Uh, that doesn't and she's native. That she's native, right? Yeah. And it's not to say that she was an open door. She you had to you had to open she you had to open that door. I think that she became kind of a central both to your part of the process, but then also to the post part of the process that became a, a, a really strong part of the story. Yeah, and it's a delicate thing, right? All of our, we all have to work in tandem with one another to ensure that this is being done well. Uh, whether on the editing end, trying to figure out how the story works for the audience, for the network, for us, because we're not exactly easy people. <laughs> we're very, we can be very particular and um, be very opinionated and but also like i said at the very heart of it staying true to the families involved because this is their stories is that they lost loved ones and you know it, it can be hard to, to think outside yourself for a long period of time but that's ultimately that's what we had to do can i ask you a question Tim squires uh, is, sure. is that allowed here sure <laughs> i just want i would love to hear um, Actually, I just want to hear you and David geek out about editing because um, that would be something that I personally would enjoy. But I just want to know the difference uh, between cutting a narrative film and cutting a documentary. You've actually had experience with both. Yeah, but it's, it's been a little while since I've, I've been <coughs> It's been like 11 years since the last time I edited a documentary. But I mean, it sounds kind of silly to say. The big thing, I mean, you're using the same equipment and pushing the same buttons and that, but the big thing you always have to keep in mind in documentary is you have to tell the truth, which if, you know, in narrative that's not an issue. You're, you're there to the people came to see a story. You, know, you just have to lie to them well. And that's what they came for. Uh, in a documentary, you know, you have 200 hours of footage. I don't know how much you have, but you know, you'll interview somebody and get have two hours worth of material there, and you're going to use a minute and 45 seconds of it. And so, if you're doing that, it's you can you can take what they intended and misrepresent it. You always have to be thinking: Am I being fair? Am I being? Am I saying having the person say what they wanted to say? Am I twisting it around to fit what we're trying to say? You know, to, and depending on what the subject matter is. Sometimes, you know, you, you feel fine taking a little bit that you want and ignoring all the stuff that was important to them. But if it's something, you know, serious and personal like this, you really need to always be thinking, um, you know, is this fair? Am I being fair to these people? Because they're real people. I'm going to see this. And, you know, for example, I worked on Fahrenheit 9 11 with Michael Moore. Very early in the process. But before they shot anything, we're still trying to figure out what it was even going to be about. And, um, you know, in that, the big thing was, you know, not only do we have to be fair, we have to be right. Because this thing is going to be closely scrutinized. And if you're doing something about something important and you get things wrong, if 
there, if you state facts wrong or something, you're, people are going to discount the whole thing. So the, the biggest difference between the two is always thinking, am I being fair and am I being truthful? You can't tell the whole truth if you told the whole truth. First of all, you don't even have access to the whole truth. You only have access to what you have. And even then, the show would be 50 hours long and nobody would watch it. So we, it's a necessary part of the process to decide, okay, this, you know, this 90% of it, 98% of it, we're not going to use. Only this is the story we're going to tell. And I wonder, were there other threads, you know, deciding what not to tell, what parts of the story to leave out? Is that a big part of the process? Here? Yeah, we had other cases, actually, uh, which is heartbreakingly we could not. Originally, this was going to be a four-hour series for Showtime. It ended up being a three-hour series for Showtime because they decided um, just to kind of tighten it up, which means that we had to lose certain things, and one of the things we lost was the case, which was... So we had shot interviews with families, and it's very sad to think um, that it didn't actually see the light of day. Um, but yeah, I mean, always, uh, it's, that's the hardest part about docs, is you shoot a thousand hours of footage, and it's a 90-minute film, so lots of things have to, have to die. Um, but back to, can I go back to my question? <laughs> sure. Um, do you find that, like, at the start of the process of doing a narrative versus doing a documentary, they're obviously as far apart as you just described them. But as you go through the process, then maybe you kind of hone in in the dock of like what the narrative is going to be. As far as like contouring the ride for a viewer, like what are the, aren't they more similar than different in that regard? Like you're basically making a film and you want the viewer to be booked in and you're using music. Yeah. Once, you, once you sort of get it into shape, and, you know, getting a narrative into shape, that's easier because we're starting from scratch. Uh, documentary, you have to, you know, figure it out from, from scratch. Uh, you know, sometimes you're presented with an idea, sometimes it's like, here's a bunch of footage, let me know when there's something to look at it, bye. Um, so, once you've got doc roughly in shape, then, yeah, you're, doing, you're using a lot of the same instincts about pacing and uh, emotion and manipulating you know, it's just in a, in a documentary, you have to have that extra thing of, am I, am I being snappy just to be cool and make the studio happy at the expense of something more meaningful? Uh, whereas in a narrative, you're just trying to tell the story as well as you can. And often, you drop big chunks of it. In Syriana, it's where you're cutting between four different stories. We shot five, but the fifth story that what was that story? Uh, what was that story? The late, the least good one. Good <laughs> <laughs> um, So, say, say a director walks into the door, right? And you're, like, you have this meeting. What is the most ideal, cool thing that the director says to you? Well, you yeah, need to convince him to, to well, take the job. Well, 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 well. Let's say you've already decided to take the project on just because you really love the story. And then they come in, and then, and then they, it's your first meeting. Even the first, let's just say, I mean, in a crazy world, that this is the first time that you're talking to them in person. What is the most ideal, like, what is it that you want to hear from them? Or what you, what you want to feel from them? You want them to care about what they're doing. That's a big thing. Uh, you know, sometimes the director is the writer, producer, and is invested. You know, eight years of their life in developing this thing. Sometimes they're kind of a director for hire, and um, you know, it, it's less a thing. But you know, you, you're involved in, in a project for somewhere between eight months and two years usually, and it's you want to care about it. You want to feel like everybody cares about it. So that's that's one big thing is they want to care about it. Um, you know, when I first met Robert Altman. Um, you know, the first thing you talk about is the script, because that's the only thing you, know, you kind of know. But what you're trying to find out is, am I going to, is this somebody I'm going to feel okay spending you know, six, eight, twelve hours a day in a room with? And just, is that going to work? Um, and, you know, so we were talking about the script, and he said, uh, I, I said, I do have a couple of issues with the script. And he said, oh, oh, okay, what are they? And I mentioned one, he said, oh, yeah, okay, so you mentioned another and he said, 
um, and they had a lot to answer to. And so we wanted them to at least sort of own their, their part of the narrative that we were exploring. We, we were telling a story about a community. We wanted to have 360 degree POV of you know, different factions, and they certainly were involved, and they had a right to state their case. But they ultimately declined. But the, the interesting thing was that the undersheriff, uh, I don't know how many of you have seen the series, but the undersheriff of Bighorn County who became the sort of like communications person that I was dealing with, uh, asking them to sit for an interview, basically sort of sidebarred with me and said, I can't sit in my official capacity as the undersheriff because I'm not allowed to. But the undersheriff turns out to be the father of one of the women that was missing. Um, and he said, I've never given an interview to media as Selena's father and I want to sit um, for an interview. So he, he sat for an interview, um, not in his official capacity as the under sheriff, but as Selena's father. In addition, we were able to finally, literally the last thing we shot, um, was an interview with the former under sheriff of Bighorn County, um, who, was, um, who was white and moved to, once he was fired, basically, the under sheriff, he moved to Idaho. Um, and the only reason he agreed to do an interview with us is because he lived now not in Bighorn County. He was afraid of retribution from the sheriff's office if he talked to us. But he was able to sit for an interview and said some, um, he, he gave a very uh, frank um, interview about his feelings towards Native people. And it was, it was quite eye-opening to see that perspective. Um, I think we're at the point where if anyone has any questions, now would be a good time. Don't be shy. Right here. Uh, this goes out to all of you. I'm just curious about how you used character in each story. Like, did you latch onto one main subject to be the main storyteller? Was the victim the main person? And did it depend on the episode? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think it was David who brought up Luella before. Uh, Luella Brin was formerly an, an uh, a journalist with the Bighorn County News. Uh, that was when we, we met her, we first interviewed with her, and really, we all just kind of hit it off in her first interview. Oh man, it went so long, huh? It was five hours. Or yeah, something. she just had so much to say, and she, she was really uninhibited, and, and uh, she really knew a lot. Not only that, she was really, um, engaged and intertwined with the community because of her role as a journalist with, with the Bighorn County News and um, in addition to that her aunt um, also had gone missing and was found dead in the mid 70s and so that she she had a sort of a family connection to this issue as well yes exactly and ultimately she became a through line for the series completely unintentionally and this is kind of when we're talking about a, a doc versus narrative. Narrative, you kind of preconceive these characters, or the notions of characters, right? With doc, um, things will happen. And you either go with it or you don't. Uh, we felt, both of us felt very strongly about Luella and her involvement and her poten potential and helping us tell a, a fuller story with these women and young women. And so we, we went with our instinct and were able to utilize her as a, as a vessel to dive deeper with her as an integrated part of community. She's also great in that she, as a journalist, she can tie all three of her. She's involved in all three of the cases and can uh, give a unity to the whole thing, which is really fortunate that you found her. The most fortunate. Yeah. I think in this kind of a story, you were up and I don't know, speak for you, but I just haven't worked on other stories with Matthew, like Murder in the you, where the families of the victims become sort of the principal storytellers, and it's so emotional, and um, those people, you just count on them to be amazing storytellers, and sometimes they are, and sometimes they're not. And that's just a bit of a drop. Um, and I think in some cases we were lucky, in some cases we weren't. Um, but Luella, because she was so connected to all these people, could sort of be a surrogate 
for some of those uh, character building and storytelling things. She had covered a lot of these cases. She knew these girls. Her kids were in school with them. There were all these other things. So it was sort of, I don't think they were used her really as a crutch, but it was sort of, it was always supportive, you know, to have Abuela in there. Back there, in the back? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm waiting for a mic. If there's any mic. No, 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 no mic. Okay. Um, I was curious if you guys talked about objectivity with regard to uh, Dr. Price. Um, so I was curious if for you guys, you know, when you were making this, um, how did you sort of gauge that? Maintaining, you know, uh, some of the objectivity that you might have to maintain when telling this sort of story, um, but then obviously making it unique enough so that you can add some of your own little sparks of flair and creativity. And uh, yeah, I guess like just towing that line you know, that's such a you know, crucial part of uh, you know documentary filmmaking. Uh, how'd you how'd you go about doing that? So, um, kind of going back to the collaborative process between Matthew and I, where there was this little bit of checks and balances that was like subconsciously going on. Um, because the story is focused on such a specific community, um, native community, uh, that's kind of like where Matthew was able to maintain the big picture perspective of like things we need to get, we have to talk about like, you know, the through line which Luella became. And then um, my role really became being able to nuance the whole series with the specificity of indi like indigeneity and culture. And um, when we're talking with, uh, with Jeff Hutchins, the, the DP, uh, Basically, uh, coming to the conclusion of shooting native people from like a lower eye line. It's super subtle, but when you shoot from a lower eye line, it makes the, the subject, you know, it gives, it empowers that subject, right? So those little subconscious decisions contributed um, to the specificity of what we were doing with the series, but I think we were always in agreement with the big picture of what murder and big porn needed to be. And I think like David, Matthew, and like the whole team, there was a, a nice balance between native and non-native to like where we were able to like, as a native person, like I said before, it could have been really easy for me to allow my biases to dictate the direction of where we could have gone. But then I always have to think of, oh yeah, there's a general audience that we're going to be showing this to, and it's just not going to be a doc series for Native people. Like, we have to explain a little more, be a little more, you know, specific, and yeah. And you know, it's, I guess we had the unfortunate luxury of having these cases be so heartbreaking that all we have to do is present them. And it, you don't necessarily need to become subjective about your take on it. It's just, let's present the facts. And it's pretty obvious that the audience will understand how screwed up this system is, why these women sort of fell through the cracks, and why this has been happening for 180 years or so. Um, so uh, we didn't have to, I guess my point is, we didn't have to sort of stylistically push a whole lot on these stories um, for them to communicate what we sort of intrinsically felt we needed to communicate to the audience. If, if anything, I felt like we had to hold back in a lot of places. You know, you sort of end up in this sort of potential for, you know, sorrow kind of pornography in a, little, in a weird way. And, Trauma um, porn. Yeah, and, trust it, and that's really hard. Um, I think that ultimately I don't think there really is objectivity, right? I mean, I think there's certain facts you have to abide by. Um, but you have a perspective and point of view when you're making a film or writing a story or whatever it is. Um, the fact that it's nonfiction means you kind of are, are stuck with certain guide rails that you have to live by. Um, to your earlier question, you know, the documentary ultimately is written in the edit for the most part. 
um, that's a, a big difference. And so you have to, and as you know, and you know, when I'm trying to make it cinematic or engaging, sometimes I go too far and some that say, hey, you know, you're bending your poop a little bit. You can't say that. You can't use that line. You know, it sounds good. It's not going that exact spot. It doesn't really. So you have to watch out. Um, but ultimately, I think that if you're uh, you know, in, in the spirit of the truth, but you have your right to your point of view, uh, you tell that story. Um, and, and then also one last thing, you know, in the beginning, we all have to decide what we're trying to do. And then try our best to maintain you know, that path as well. And if I could just follow up to um, actually touching back on what you're saying too about like, different processes in post production and production, right? So I guess, it, I mean, there's like a saying, right? Like a movie in and of itself is three different movies, right? It's the pre production, development stage, and production, and then obviously if you do, you know, the editing side of the thing. Um, I guess, like, was there anything that stood out in any of those, you know, processes that you could say, yeah, I don't know, I don't sort of discovered, I'm sure you've discovered so many different things throughout the entire journey that um, I, I just, I feel like there's probably so much that you guys are going through that you probably, by the end of it, you're probably so tired and just like, oh my god, but, um, I'm sure a lot of discoveries me as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, as we were talking about before, we started this um, in the sort of true crime genre, but we realized roughly the midpoint that like, we weren't going to solve these cases. There wasn't necessarily an end as far as if you're following a true crime story, it perhaps wouldn't be a satisfying ending to you, which means we didn't catch the person. But Rizal pushed hard in the middle of the process, and um, we're very lucky that she did, to look backwards and look at the history. And so that was like a big pivot that we made. So in pre-production, we were really thinking about the cases specifically, and like how they intertwined, and what stories they were telling, and we always talked about the bigger themes and some of the history, but ultimately in the series, it's really like a, it's a balancing act between true crime and narratives that are sort of moving forward, and then a history that's moving backwards. Um, and that was all sort of midstream in the edit. That was a decision that we had made. And, and uh, I think ultimately the, the series is stronger for it, and I think it's more probably more unique out there because I don't think that there's another, um, certainly not another true crime series like it. So, thank you, Rizzo. We have time for one, one more question. So, okay. Tim, you get to pick. Hi. Um, I'm just curious about sort of the tug of war between the corporate and the creative part. As you said, Rick Showtime said we went this true drama and then you came up with this great vision. How did you pull that along to your side of the, uh, of the idea? <laughs> Uh, very, yeah, it was, it was a very stressful process. Yes, yeah, this guy. Um, so, and, you know, and, uh, I've had a, a decades-long relationship with them, and the, and the executives that, um, that run that department are close friends. So it wasn't like, a, it was, nothing was personal. It was more like, you know, when they saw the first cut, it wasn't necessarily what they expected it to be. I always use the um, analogy that um, they wanted a boy and we gave them a girl. <laughs> uh, and they're equally fantastic, but it's not necessarily the thing that they were looking for. So, um, so it took months to actually like, sort of convince them that this might be a more satisfying series if, we're, if we go into the sort of historical realm in addition to the true crime realm. Um, and ultimately, you know, we finally started turning in edits uh, and David can certainly attest to how um, how uh, white knuckly of a ride that was for a few months, but like finally they saw stuff that they really liked and they understood what we were trying to do, um, and it got better. And ultimately they were amazing partners. And you know we premiered this series at Sundance. And Showtime was incredibly generous, and, um, did tons of publicity for the series, and um, you know had a great release. So it all it all it all worked out in the end, but it was not. Pleasant. And ultimately, you're constrained by the material you have, whether it's on a narrative or, uh, or a doc. And uh, often part of the job is you know, making it as good as you can, but the other part of the job, which is just as important is sometimes, is making them understand that this is what we shot. This is the best that we can do with the material we have. 
And if you had in your mind that this was a big you know, mystery story, but that one doesn't work. So with, with what we have, with the material that we've got to work with, this is what we think is the best approach. And sometimes convincing them that is quick and sometimes it takes a long time and sometimes they never really give up. They, I mean, they just want people to watch. That's what they care about. They just want eyeballs on the show. They want the ratings. And so if you veer off the formula, it scares them. And oftentimes what we've been saying is that the, the mystery of our show isn't really like this whole true crime thing. It's the mystery lies within the history, right? A lot of this happens because of the way things are set up, you know? And you take you on a little bit of a dive with the history regarding why this is all occurring. How the, how the U.S. government set up the reservation system is really the core. Um, that we sort of get to by the third hour. Okay, well, thank you all for coming. Sarah, do you want to thank you. Thank you.